opportunity to be here today, Lord. I thank you for how you love us. I thank you for um, your word and the truths that are in it for us, Lord. And I pray that you give us just the um, hearts of students and the minds that would receive it. Help us to have the wisdom to apply this to our life. Pray for me that I wouldn't be nervous or um, that I would speak clearly. And that it wouldn't be about me, though. That it would be about your word and glorifying your name, Father. So I pray that you just go before this, Lord. And uh, I just thank you, Lord. Praise in Jesus. Amen. Okay, so I really didn't think about how I was going to um, sum up the last chapter, but it's been two weeks now. It seems like a long time. And um, in chapter 11, we saw Joshua take the Israelites and they went and they defeated the northern kings. And they went and they chased them around the north and then they mopped them up. And basically, long story short, we ended with that, with the land resting from war. And so now we're going into chapter 12, and chapter 12 is very much just a summary chapter. If it's in here, there might, there's some new information in here, but if it's like a main theme in here, it's probably written somewhere else in the Bible. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go through the first six verses. We're going to talk about it. You're going to find that we're really front-weighted, we're really, really weighted towards the front here. So don't get nervous if it seems like I've only went through six verses and we're 20 minutes in. You're probably two minutes from being done. All right? So let's do this. I start in verse 1 of chapter 12 in Joshua. These are the kings of the land whom the children of Israel defeated and whose land they possessed on the other side of the Jordan toward the rising of the sun from the river Arnon to Mount Hermon and all the eastern Jordan plain, one king was Sihon, king of the Amorites, who dwelt in Heshbon and ruled over Gilead, or half of Gilead, from Aror, which is on the bank of the river Arnon, to the middle of that river, even as far as the river Jabbok, which is on the border of the Ammonites, and the eastern Jordan plain from the Sea of Chinnereth as far as the Sea of Araba, which is the Salt Sea, the road to Beth Bashan, no, the road to Beth Jeshemoth, and southward below the slopes of Pisgah. The other, was king, the other king was Og, king of Bashan in his territory, who was of the remnant of the giants, who dwelt at Ashtaroth and at Adre, and reigned over Mount Hermon, over Salka, over Bashan, as far as the border of the Geshurites and the Machathites, over half of Gilead, to the border of Sihon, king of Heshbon, and then 6 ends this section with, These Moses, the servant of the Lord, and the children of Israel had conquered. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, had given it as a possession to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh. So I want to talk about this section here for a minute. Um, we're given a better account of the battles between these two kings and Moses. Back in Deuteronomy, it's, there's an account of it in Numbers, there's an account of it, then a recounting of it in Deuteronomy, um, and Moses is going to tell us more details. At this point, when it happens, the, 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 the 40 years of them being in the wilderness for the Israelites is coming to an end, that rebellious generation has passed away, and Moses is, at the end of his life here, he's positioning the Israelites to take hold what God has promised to them. And please keep in mind that the lands ruled by King Sihon and King Og, these are not lands that are part of the promised land. Deuter the Deuteronomy 26 starts, And I sent messengers from the wilderness of Kedemoth to Sihon, king of Heshbon, with words of peace, saying, Let me pass through your land. I will keep strictly to the road, and I will turn neither to the right nor to the left. You shall sell me money or sell me food for money that I may eat, and give me water for money that I may drink. Only let me pass through on foot, just as the descendants of Esau who dwell in Seir and the Moabites who dwell in Ar did for me, until I crossed the Jordan to the land which the Lord our God is giving us. So at this point, we can see as Moses is approaching the first of these kings, Sihon, he has no intention to fight. 
God had told the Israelites to take the promised land, and Moses is simply attempting to walk in God's will. Despite this, though, Deuteronomy 2.30 states, But Sihon, king of Heshbon, would not let us pass through. For the Lord your God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate, that God might deliver him into your hand as it is this day. Now, at this point in the story, there are some interesting takeaways for us. Jeremiah 10.23 says, O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. This is one of many verses in the scriptures that makes this point. We have free will to follow God or not. Regardless of our choice, God still directs our steps. So take either side in this conflict. In this conflict, Moses as the servant of God or Sihon as a man opposed to God. And it's clear to see that it is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. If Moses had had his own way, the children of Israel would have been able to pass peacefully through Sihon's land. Paying for anything they needed, they would have stayed on the road, but that was not God's way. And think about Sihon. Moses' proposal could have been very lucrative for his nation. We're talking about tens of thousands of peoples passing through his land, needing provisions, and having plenty of gold from Egypt to pay for these things. They weren't going to trample the land. There was nothing insulting about Moses' request to pass through. And there was already a precedent sent by two other countries that let them go through. But it was not God's way for Sihon to let them through. We see God harden the hearts of kings multiple times throughout the scriptures when their time for judgment has arrived. Pharaoh, during the ten plagues, King Sihon and King Og here. And we last, the last study, we saw the hearts of the northern kings harden. When I think of a man whose heart that God has hardened, I picture a man on the edge of a bank of a raging river. And as he sins, he begins to wade into the water, up to the ankle at first, and then up to your shin. There's nothing dangerous about being up to your shin in water. It's cool. It feels good. He moves further in, deeper into his sin. And as he does, his pride grows and he feels more secure. Eventually, he makes it to the middle of this raging river, unaware that this entire time there's been a hand reaching down from heaven, holding on to the scruff of his neck, keeping his sin from entirely washing him away. When I think of God hardening a man's heart, I don't believe that God is ever forcing a man to do something. Rather, God simply removes his hand from that man in the stream and allows the flow and the gravity of that man's sin to move him along its natural course. There's something very dangerous if you're unsaved right now about postponing your salvation. I believe that many people believe in the tenets of Christianity. They might not understand it, but, but they put off turning to God because they enjoy their sin, or at least they believe they enjoy their sin. They assume that there will be a time and a place for salvation down the road, perhaps when we settle down, whatever that means. 2 Corinthians 6, verses 1 and 2 says, We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For God says, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. What people don't understand is, our fleshly desires are never ready to settle down. So we continue to kick the can on down the road. Paul tells us in Romans 2, verses 4 and 5, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, 
his forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath and the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. Sin leads to death. Now, let's go back to Moses for a second. He had good intentions. He sent messengers with words of peace to the king. His purpose was to get through to the, through to the promised land to do what God had told him to do. You, as a Christian, may have every intention to glorify God and do his will in your life. You may make plans accordingly, and everything still might go sideways. You may find yourself in a battle that you didn't even ask for. It can be demoralizing. I'm not sure if this demoralized Moses when Sihon came against them and the people. But we do see God give them encouragement. Deuteronomy 2, 31 through 34 says, and The Lord said to me, See, I have begun to give Sihon and his land over to you. Begin to possess it that you may inherit his land. And it goes on to say what happened. Then Sihon and all his people came out against us to fight at Jehaz. And the Lord our God delivered him over to us. So we defeated him, his sons and all his people. We took all his cities at that time, and we utterly destroyed the men, women, and little ones of every city. We left none remaining. We took only the livestock as plunder for ourselves with the spoils of the cities which we took. And immediately after this battle, King Og attacks the Israelites. Once again, Israel is in a battle that it did not ask for, but now they're against giants. Once again, we see God encourage them in Numbers 21, verses 34 through 35. Then the Lord said to Moses, do not fear him, for I have delivered him into your hand and all his people and his land, and you shall do to him as you did to Sihon, king of the Amorites who dwelled in Heshbon. So they defeated him, his sons, and all his people, until there was no survivor left him. And they took possession of his land. And so we see God speak to Moses. I would assume this is when Moses is in the tabernacle. And through Moses, God speaks to the people of Israel these words of encouragement. It seems crazy to say but although as God is speaking directly to Moses, who in turn speaks to Israel, we as Christians have a better arrangement. Our intercessor is not Moses, it's Christ. Romans 8.34 says, Who then is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us. Hebrews 7.25 says, Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he, Christ, always lives to make intercession for them. Not only do we have the perfect intercessor, but through Christ we have superior access to God than the Israelites did. Hebrews 4, 15 through 16 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. The Israelites could not enter the tabernacle on a whim to speak to God whenever they wanted to. But we can take our concerns straight to the throne. And you may have never heard God speak encouragement or wisdom to you audibly. Instead, God speaks to us consistently through his word. And that's why it's so important to read your Bible. Romans 15.4 says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete 
thoroughly equipped for every good work. You know, it's amazing how something can happen and somewhere from the back of your brain, God brings to mind a scripture that applies to that situation. Maybe it encourages you or instructs you. Maybe it brings you up short. But God is speaking to you. That verse, when you read it, might not have been applicable in the same way. But according to Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Not only that, Romans 10, 17 tells us, so then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You know, it's hard to apply the promises of God if you're ignorant of them. It's hard to believe in something that you don't know. For example, a verse spoke to me this past week. And it's applicable to Moses as he trusts in God and despite his plans not coming to fruition. So I'm going to read it. Proverbs 16.3, commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. So when you have vacation plans and your car breaks down, something stupid happens at work and you know something stupid always happens at work. Or everything goes better than expected. If you committed these things to the Lord, you can have the peace of mind that passes all understanding. Because you know that God is directing your path. It's kind of funny. In the last week of school, I came down with a bug, sickness, and it resulted in me having this deep cough and feeling gunky for like two weeks, the first few weeks of summer. Towards the end of this, Amy and I went to visit her family in Idaho, and that was a lot of fun. But while we were there, I got these crazy allergies. My nose was running. I was sneezing. I had that congestion around here. Coming back from Idaho, as we descended into the valley, all this congestion prevented my ears from popping. So I had muffled hearing. And it seemed like there was an echo when I chewed food for a couple more weeks. I went to the doctor who was going to give me a shot. And as I rolled up my sleeve, she kind of smiled and said, that's not where it's going. (laughs) Not to mention we had a bit of car trouble. The summer didn't get off to the best start. It got off to a hot start, not a hot start for me. I'm a teacher, and my first child is due in fall. I had committed this summer to me. (laughs) And because things didn't go as I had planned them, you can ask ask Amy for this. I was a bit of a crybaby at times during this time. And what's funny is that looking back on the summer, many of the moments that I absolutely enjoyed this summer were when Amy and I were able to get together with other believers at various Bible studies, going through the Word, fellowshipping, playing games, being at family camp. It didn't matter if we had to clean the house or mop the floor because people were coming over. I genuinely looked forward to these times. These were the things that I had committed to the Lord this summer. And it's not to say that I didn't have joy at other times. It's been a great summer. It's just funny how that works out, though. So that's how God can work in our lives. Regarding the word, throwing in a corny story here at the last second. McGee told the story. About 1920s, 1930s, cars were still a thing to be seen in areas that you might not have seen before. And so in the middle of nowhere, I don't know if it was Arkansas or Oklahoma, let's call it Oklahoma, there's this podunk town, and a guy's going somewhere, and he's lost. He he has maps, paper maps. His map is not good. He drives through the town, 
And he sees some kids playing, and he stops, and he rolls down the window and yells at the kid. The kid's just checking out the, the, the he's never seen a car before. He's just, you know, wide-eyed, four-year-old, little toe-headed kid, right? Looking at the car, the guy yells at him, hey, where am I? And the kid just kind of looks at this. And the guy's like getting impatient. He's, he's late already. Hey, where am I? And the kid says, Dar you are. <laughs> That's what the word does for us sometimes. It lets us know where we're at. It brings us up short, encourages us. You've got to be in the word. I'm going to get one more drink. Hopefully this will finish it out. Joshua 12, 6. These, speaking of the kings, these Moses, the servant of the Lord, and the children of Israel had conquered. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, had given it as a possession to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. We'll speak more about the, the land given to the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh in the next study. I, I assume I'm still tech, um, teaching next week. Um, just keep in mind that this land is not the promised land. We'll talk more about that next week. All right. Let's go. Joshua 7. And these are the kings of the country which Joshua and the children of Israel conquered on this side of the Jordan, on the west from Baal Gad in the valley of Lebanon, as far as Mount Halak in the ascent of Seir, which Joshua gave to the tribes of Israel as a possession according to their divisions, in the mountain country, in the lowlands, in the Jordan plain, in the slopes, in the wilderness, and in the south, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, the king of Jericho, one, the king of Ai, which is beside Bethel, one. The king of Jerusalem, one. The king of Hebron, one. The king of Jarmuth, one. The king of Lachish, one. The king of Eglon, one. The king of Gezer, one. The king of Deber, one. The king of Geter, one. The king of Horma. Thank you. I'm sorry. I feel like a rock star right there. The king of Arid, one. The king of Libna, one. The king of Adullam, one. The king of Makeda, one. The king of Bethel, one. The king of Tapua, one. The king of Hefer, one. The king of Aphek, one. The king of Lasharon, one. The king of Maidan, one. The king of Hazer, one. The king of Shimron, Miron, one. The king of Akshaf, one. The king of Tanak, one. The king of Megiddo, one. The king of Kadesh, one. The king of Jokneum in Carmel, one. The king of Dor in the heights of Dor, one. The king of the people of Gilgal, one. The king of Terza, one. All the kings, 31. I, um, First of all, I read this and I kind of slapped my forehead. And I was like, really? This is the chapter I'm teaching? Because this is the rest of the chapter, basically. And so, um, first of all, it bugged me that they say one after every, and there's never a two or a three or a six or something like that. We can assume it's a one, but that was however they chose to write. And great, there's nothing wrong with that. When I do a study, I like to get into it. I like to look up the stuff and then see how the word speaks to me before I listen to any teachings by someone like Chuck Smith or Vernon McGee. When then I re when I read through um, when I read through this list of names though and realized that it comprised the majority of this chapter, it didn't take long before I was downloading McGee to see what he got out of it. So I'm going to give you a rough quote of what he said. This is and it's, it's a rough quote, but it's something along the lines of. Now we come to a list of kings conquered by Joshua, and I'm not going to read a single one of these verses. Thanks, McGee. He did end up making a point at the end of the chapter um, about the verses. So I'll read my takeaways, and then I'll share his as well. Chuck Smith, for his part, gave 26 seconds 
to this entire, entire chapter. But to be fair, his style, he's to move really quickly through the Bible so that he might cover multiple chapters, maybe a half dozen in a night. So, first, we were told in the previous study that Joshua made war a long time with all those kings. I wanted to read through these verses rather than simply mention them so that we could see simply how long it took just to read through them. Obviously, we saw in the last study that God made it a bit more convenient for Joshua by bringing many of these kings together at the waters of Merom, where they were all defeated. But when you account for the kings that weren't there and all the mop-up duty that had to occur, this was a huge undertaking. With the exception of the first battle of Ai, though, it was always done in the power of God. Second, these 31 kings probably amounted to hundreds of cities that needed to be dealt with. For example, Deuteronomy tells us that when Moses went to Bashan and defeated King Og, King Og, which is one king, this entailed taking 60 cities. One takeaway that McGee made was that when you read lists like these, which include kings or geographical locations, it goes to show you that God thinks these details are important. It might not seem important to us here, but these verses are the type that equip archaeologists with the tools to confirm the events of the Bible, of the Bible, whether they intend to confirm them or not. McGee concluded that we shouldn't hesitate to bring the little details to God as well. It always baffled me too when someone weighs in on an area where the scripture is silent, where God hasn't decided not to give us that information, it wasn't important for us. And this person, rather than acknowledging that they are speculating, they make a mountain that they're willing to die on out of their own point of view of what might have happened. Second, or 1 Corinthians 8.1 tells us that knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. Or as Pastor Bob used to say, major in the majors, minors in the mi minor in the minors, stupid. I'm actually going to wrap it up here. Except for one more thing. Last week, we ended with this verse in Joshua 11:23. So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord had said to Moses, and Joshua gave it as an inheritance to Israel according to their divisions by their tribes. Then the land rested from war. Next week, we will start with this verse. Now Joshua was old, advanced in years, and the Lord said to him, You are old, advanced in years. That's a pretty mean way to put it, huh, Jim? <laughs> and there remains much... Sorry, I'm preaching right now. I can't talk right now. Um, there remains very much land yet to be possessed. At a glance, it seems like these verses clash with each other. Joshua did it all. There remained very much land. Did Joshua take the whole land, or did there remain very much land to be possessed? Next week, we're going to see that both of these verses are true, and they do not contradict each other. But it's going to lead to other topics that we don't have time to talk about tonight. So with that... Let's pray. Oh, real fast, actually. If you want to do some homework, read Hebrews chapter 4. It goes right along with this, what we'll talk about next week. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, I just thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to get into your word. I pray, Lord, that you would just be with us, that you would guide us, that we would be growing in you, filled with your spirit, and that we'd be given over those areas in our lives that we hold on to. And I pray, Lord, that you just be strong on our behalf. I know that you will. I thank you for your love. I pray that we'd be able just to love others, Lord, and, and, and grow in you. And I just want to lift up those firefighters and the policemen and everyone involved up in Chico or wherever it's at. At this point, I, you would just bless them, keep them safe, Father. I pr pray that you just give people wisdom, help them to be able to put this thing out. And uh, I do pray that your will is done, but I just I lift them up, Father. Thank you for your love, Lord, and I just pray you go before the rest of this week for us. There is in Jesus' name.